Good morning. I, uh, I'm really a programming language geek, so I'm um, interested in building better programming languages. Particularly, I've been interested in a language called Haskell. So if you ever come across Haskell, just use it. It's great. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about Haskell today because I like giving talks about other people's work. So this is a talk about uh, the work of a guy called Andrew Goldberg, who actually works in the um, uh, Silicon Valley bit of Microsoft research. Uh, so it talks about route finding. Here's something you might do on your uh, phone, is to say, I want to go from uh, uh, one place to another, and please find me a route to, to do that. So that's something that all of us do every day. We kind of take it for granted. Um, but of course, it's a very old problem. Uh, it goes right back to 1960, at least. So there's a very nice story arc, because not much happened between 1960-70 um, and uh, 2006. I'm going to tell you what happened in 2006 and give you some, so I'm going to show you some old, very clever ideas and some new, very clever ideas uh, that are probably running on your phone today. Okay, so that's the sort of story arc of this talk. Um, so why, you might think, would you worry about, if, it, if, if this problem had been solved in 1960, why should we worry about it now? Uh, well, the reason is because phones don't have as much computing power as big computers. And even if you have a big computer and you're running this root finding thing on a server farm, people these days are getting a bit worried about how much energy server farms are consuming. So if you could just do the same job with a bit more cunning and a bit less brute force, you'd lose less energy to do the same job. So the same thing applies to server farms as phones in a funny kind of way. Uh, so this talk is about applying cunning ideas to save a lot of work and energy. So here's the problem. We're trying to find the route from A to B. Um, so here's a, the first classic thing that computer scientists always do is to try to boil the problem down into some more abstract idea. So here it is. We'll take a map. We'll stick a red dot, which I call a vertex, on every intersection. And then we'll put a, just a straight line and arc between each of these vertices. And then we'll measure the time it takes to drive um, or cycle. I ride a bicycle. Um, along from, uh, one, um, from one place to the next. So some of these roads are long, but are fast roads, so the time it takes is short. Some of them may look short, but they're very narrow, windy roads, so they take longer. So the numbers here are times, not distances. Okay? So that's one abstraction we've made. We don't, we're not, we're, now we, we're going to forget about the, um, the map part, because all we're really interested now is what the intersections are and how long it takes to get from here to, here to there. Right? So um, now we can just choose our start and end points and try to find the shortest route in this map. And once you find the shortest route in this little connected bunch of dots and lines, then you can stick the map back right, at the end, and then you can sort of draw a funny wiggly line along the roads. So that's a separate step. So the bit, the bit that I'm going to be interested in is just the, um, uh, is just the bit for, given the, um, this uh, collection of dots and lines between them, which mathematicians call a graph, I'm going to be interested in how can we find the shortest path from a given starting point to a given end point, uh, taking account of the length of each of these arcs, which is written on them. That's, this is called an edge-weighted graph. And I'm going to write this um, SP for shortest path from A to B. So here we are. Here's a possible algorithm for getting from A to B. This is the algorithm my mother uh, used to use. She would start at A and drive randomly around until she got to B. Uh, this worked, but it was slow. Um, right, typically, she would get to B eventually, but not by the shortest route or indeed anything like it. So what can we do? Um, something a bit faster. So here's uh, Dijkstra's idea. So this is 1959, the year after I was born, a very important year. Um, so he had this idea that said, well, look, let's, let's uh, ink blot our way out from the starting point. So he said, let's, uh, dis let's m color the nodes three different colors, uh, red, yellow, and green. Red means I don't know anything about this node. Green means I know exactly how far this vertex is from the, from the starting point A. So a green-colored node also has a number on it. I'll write that green brackets N. And that's going to mean that the distance from A to this vertex, V, is exactly N steps. OK? Now, gr that's green nodes. Yellow nodes are the one in between when I don't kind of know everything about it. Um, so yellows are still going to have an N attached to them. And what that's really going to mean, if you can remember this, is that the shortest green-only path from A, the starting point, to this vertex V, the yellow vertex, the shortest path going through only green nodes, except for V itself, is going to be exactly length N. Okay, that's my plan for what yellow N is going to mean. Right? So I'm going to start, I start off, this is Dijkstra, you start off with every node colored red, I don't know anything about them, except the very first node, A, and I know that's yellow, I know it's exactly zero from the starting point. In fact, um, 
Uh, so I'm going to make it yellow zero. And then at each step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one yellow node, the one with the smallest n, and I'm going to turn it green and somehow propagate that knowledge that it's green to its neighbors. So I'm going to show you that um, with little uh, sort of uh, slide by slide. So here we are. We start off with our little map, and uh, here's the starting point, yellow, zero. So I pick the smallest yellow node. There is only one. Let's pick that one. Turn it green. So it goes to green. And, and then I'm going to propagate to its immediate neighbors. Look back, right? Its, its neighbors were red before. So its neighbors are going to turn yellow. Oh, dear, I went two slides. Um, its neighbors are going to turn yellow, and I'm going to add to the zero in A. I'm going to add 10, because it's 10, 10 minutes along here and 15 minutes along here. Okay? So now those yellow nodes say how far they are along a green-only path, at any rate. And now I'm going to pick, again, the, the yellow node with the smallest n. What's that? That's this one here. That's 15. That's 10. That's smaller. So the big purple arrow is pointing to the yellow node I'm going to deal with next. Right? It's the one with the smallest value of n. So I'm going to pick that, and I'm going to turn it green and propagate its information to its immediate neighbors. Well, it's got three immediate neighbors, this one, this one, and, oh, this one. But I'm not going to change the green nodes, because I already know the distance from the green nodes, so I'm going to leave them alone. Duck's just going to leave them alone. So this guy turns green. Uh, what it, so he was 10. I add 1 to get 11 for this one. I add 1 to get 11 for this one. And I pick any yellow node with the smallest value. There are three yellow nodes now, 11, 11, 15. I pick, I've just arbitrarily picked this one. I could have picked that one. It doesn't really make any difference. Okay? So now I proceed in the same way. Uh, turn it green and propagate to its neighbors. So I've turned it green, added three here. Uh, did Oh, look, something interesting happened here. This said 11. When I turned this guy green, did I add four and make that 15? That would be a stupid thing to do, right? I already know there is a green-only path to this guy, which is of length 11. So it would be a bit silly to say, oh, there's also a green-only path this way. So I'm only going to, when I, when I do this propagating business, I'm going to make sure that I don't ever increase the value in a node. I'm only going to decrease it. Make sense? Any questions so far? No. Good. OK. All right. So some of you have seen this algorithm before. I just want to make sure you understand it. Right. So then we, now we pick uh, uh, this one, 14, and we propagate him to 22. Oh, he's, now we've got to B. B is our target. That's our destination. Are we done? Well, he's yellow. What does that mean? That means the shortest green-only path to B is 22 um, that we know so far. But the, my, this path might be shorter. After all, if that was 2 and that was 2, then we go 15 uh, um, plus 4 is 21. Oh, that will be uh, 19. That will be shorter, right? So uh, we're not done yet. We just have to do a couple more steps to make sure that we... Um, uh, propagate everything around. And finally, in fact, the shortest path is 22 when finally this guy turns green. Okay? When he turns green, remember, the property of green nodes was the shortest path from A to the green node is exactly N. So there we are. We found the shortest path. Okay, so here's the, here's the algorithm I was doing. If the node W, so I've got an, an initial, um, I'm turning uh, vertex V from yellow to green. I turn into green and I propagate to the neighbors. For each neighbor W, I say, if, if W is green, I don't change at all. If W is yellow, well, I do change him, provided that makes the value go down. And if W was red, then I change him to yellow. That's Dijkstra's algorithm, OK? Now, uh, so now here's an exercise. If, you're, if you've seen this before, you should, oh, yes, question. How would you stop it going off on random tangents? So, you mean, if I was starting here and my destination was there, how would you stop it going off all over here? That's a very good question. That's what the rest of the talk is about. So hold it and ask it again if I haven't answered your question in about 10 minutes' time. All right? Because that because actually does go off on random tangents. He's fun. OK, any other questions? Uh, OK, we're still in 1959, remember? Right? You weren't even born when this guy invented this algorithm. But if, you're, uh, if you've seen this before, just, just prove this. Right? I've shown you, by a kind of animation in one example, this algorithm working. But you really ought to be able to prove. I don't think you need to know anything more than I've shown you. To, with a pencil and paper, I think you would have enough information now to write down a proof that every green node is the shortest path from A to V, or has an N that is the, sh the distance at the length of the shortest path, that every yellow node has as its N the shortest green-only path from that vertex, um, and every, well, every red, they do, you don't have anything to prove. So if you prove that, 
then you're done. Because um, then when the, the destination turns green, well, then it, is, it has a value in it that is the shortest path. So all you've got to do is prove this. So if your attention is beginning to wander, just uh, get your pencil and paper out and prove this. I shall take um, solutions afterwards. Oh, these, uh, as uh, some of you will know, the probably, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe all of you know, these are called the invariants, right? Because these are the things that don't change. Every step maintains the invariant. The invariant is true at the beginning. You take a step, invariant still true. You take a step, invariant still true. You take step after step at the end, invariant still true. And happily, the invariant implies that you've solved the problem, right? That's a really good way of proving that algorithms are correct. So, if you, you must have seen this before. Just put your hand up if you've seen the term invariant, if you've taught, been taught the term invariant so far in your A-level courses. or Not very many. Oh, oh, oh. A-level teachers, this is really cool technique, right? <laughs> okay, so what's happening here? I'm doing ink blotting. What Dijkstra does is, remember, he picks the yellow node that's closest to the starting point. Right? And he expands it. So you get an ink blot with a sort of yellow skin and a big green patch in the middle, and the yellow skin keeps expanding in all directions. So this comes back to your question, right? Which is that I'm going off in, um, I'm going away from my destination as well as towards. So here's a concrete example. This is um, uh, Oregon, or the Pacific Northwest. This is Oregon State in Washington. Remember, this was got done by a guy at Microsoft Research, so he's rather. Um, focus on the northwest of the United States. So here it is. Here's Seattle or something up here. So here's where you start. Here's where you want to get to. And what happens if you apply this algorithm? Well, it ink blots its way out, but in, in its ink blotting, by the time it's got here, it's also gone way down here as well. Right? So it's, it's uh, explored. Or maybe perhaps we started here. I forget. Anyway, it's explored way too much of the map, right? You would never, if you were trying to get from, from uh, here to here, you would not explore roads down here, would you? That would be stupid. So uh, uh, a very obvious extra thing you might do is just explore from both ends at once. So this is a modification of Dijkstra's algorithm. It was invented about the same time. Just start from both ends at once and ink blot your way Right, until the, the, the things, and now you can see, look, here's one ink blot, and here's the other ink blot, and when they meet up, kazam, you find the shortest path. So that's a lot better, right, a lot better, but it's still not very good, because we're still exploring small hamlets in complete detail, in a small town down here, we're doing every little road in some little village down in the corner here, when we're really trying to get to Seattle. It's pretty stupid, isn't it? All right, so... How could we improve this? Or, ah, let's see. Why is it not completely stupid? It's not completely stupid for the following reason. Um, uh, oh, boy, sorry. There's Dijkstra. He, he died in 2002, but he was a really good guy. You should read things that he wrote. He has very nice writing style. A bit, um, what's the word, polemical, but uh, very stimulating. All right. Now, why is it not completely stupid to explore this little town down here? Well, it's because in the middle, let's say the village of, um, oh, I don't know, Swatham Bulbeck is down here, right? So imagine it being near Cambridge somewhere. It might be worth exploring the, even the smallest road in Swatham Bulbeck because it might be that there's a hyperspace warp from Swatham Bulbeck to Seattle, right? Look, the, oh, drat, there might be a little, a, a sort of, a very fast road, very, very, very fast road from Swatham Bulbeck to Seattle in two minutes. There's no, if, you just, if I just show you the graph, that, that, those dots and lines, there's no way to know that there isn't such a fast road. Right? We know because we know about physics. But the algorithm doesn't know because all it knows was dots and lengths. I've answered your question about uh, why it's not, it's not simple to avoid going in the opposite direction. Because under space warp technology, going in the opposite direction might be just the right thing to do because then you can space warp your way to where you want to get. All right? Okay, so people realized this, right, and about 1968, uh, they said, oh, maybe we could figure a better way to do this. We'd like to make, uh, in, add some knowledge about the shortest distance it could possibly be. And so this is an algorithm called A star. What Dijkstra does is he says, pick the, the, the yellow vertex with the smallest n, and the A star guys say, pick the yellow vertex, not with the smallest n, but the smallest n plus l of v, what's l? l is the lower bound, is an estimate for the fastest you could possibly get from v to your destination. 
All right? So we don't know that you could get from V to the destination in that time, but we know that you couldn't get there any faster. So a, um, uh, here's, a, uh, here's an example. Oh, look, here's an example. I'm going from London to Troon. Troon is a town near Glasgow. And if I ink blot my way out, I might go to Brighton or to Birmingham. I'm ink blotting my way out from London. Right? Now, we know that it's not very sensible to first go to Brighton if you really want to go to Glasgow. And how do we know that? Well, supposing we know that so Brighton is yellow and Birmingham are both yellow, so we, we, got, we, know, we know them, right? If we were doing the ink blot thing, we'd say, oh, Brighton is closer to London, it has a smaller N, so I'll, I'll explore that one next. But if we add on the crow flies distance, we can't go faster than a straight road from Brighton to Glasgow, right? So if we take the Euclidean as the crow flies motorway from Brighton to Glasgow, that would be a lower bound for the distance, 650 miles. Same crow flies distance from Birmingham to Glasgow, 400 miles. So now 100 plus 650, that's 750, and that is bigger than uh, 120 plus 400, that's only 520, so I'll explore the Birmingham one next. Does that make sense? Nod if it makes sense. More nods. OK. Thank you. OK, so this is kind of embodying our common sense, right? We're saying, uh, uh, combine something about lower bound stuff. So um, you, the, lower, this, the lower bound needs to be somehow sensible. It needs to obey the triangle inequality. I'm not going to uh, pause here. But it, you, your lower bound estimate, this L thing, which is part, something you need to supply, uh, we're going to talk about how we might get L, it's just we'll get one possible L is the Euclidean distance. That's easy to calculate, right? You can just calculate the direct distance between two things if you know where they are geographically. Then it must obey the triangle inequality. Trust me, if it doesn't, the algorithm doesn't work. But happily, Euclidean distance does, so we're happy. Now. The sad thing is, this really doesn't work very well, right? It's all very tantalizing and great, but it doesn't work very well. Can anybody think why it doesn't work well? Right, so, so some roads are very fast and some roads are slow. Uh, and that means that if I take a lower bound here, this crow flies distance, what is the shortest distance time it could possibly take from Brighton to Glasgow? For the shortest distance, shortest time, I have to assume that there is the fastest possible motorway, right? So my lower bounds, in order to be sure that they were lower bounds, I would have to assume the fastest possible road. But if there isn't a fastest possible road, then what you're saying, if there are only snaky mountain roads from Brighton, then, the, then my estimate would be way out. The point is, the better that the lower bound estimate is, the better the algorithm works. If you have bad estimates, you get a bad algorithm. And here's a way to think about it. Oh, uh, here's a way to think about it. If you have, um, if you, here's your estimate of the lower bound from V to B. Remember, B is the destination. If your estimate is zero, well, that's definitely correct. Zero is a lower bound. You cannot possibly get faster than zero. And that's what Dijkstra's algorithm does, remember. Dijkstra's algorithm essentially says if L of, you pick the, vertex with the smallest n plus L of v, if L of v is zero, you pick the vertex with the smaller n, that's Dijkstra. So choosing L of v to be zero is Dijkstra's algorithm. If you chose L of v to be the exact distance from v to b, the exact shortest path, that too would be a correct lower bound, if only we miraculously knew it. But if we miraculously did know the exact lower bound from v to b, so the exact distance from v to b, and we always chose that to be L of v, then we would always pick as our next node the exact correct one on the path. So in fact, the algorithm would explore precisely the correct path from a to b, but only if you clairvoyantly knew the path to begin with. See the problem? So what are we going to do? So A star says, well, choose a, lower bound that, choose a lower bound of some kind. The A star was these guys, right? These three guys invented this back in um, 1968. Uh, but the, it all depends on having a good lower bound estimate. And Euclidean distance is not a good lower bound estimate. So what happens is with Dijkstra, you get circular ink blots. With a not very good lower bound estimate, you get uh, a sort of oval, right? You're, you're sort of biased towards the destination, but it's still too squidgy like this. If you have a really, really good lower bound estimate, you get um, 
uh, this, you get a sort of direct path, right? Because you always follow the precisely correct path. So what we'd like to do is to get a better lower bound. And that's the main idea that I want to tell you in the next five minutes. All right? So this finally takes us up to 2006. <sighs> right. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out the, um, uh, a bound for, we're starting at London, we got to Birmingham to Brighton, and we want a lower bound on the distance from Brighton to, to Troon and the distance from Birmingham to Troon. Now, Andrew Goldberg and his colleagues' idea had the following idea. If we had a landmark, let's say the city of Glasgow, suppose we treated that as a landmark, and before we started this whole game, we computed the exact distance from every node to Glasgow. Right? Just imagine doing that. Right? So this is before we start. The very first thing we do uh, you know, when we ship the phone is before shipping the phone, we calculate the distance from every vertex in the graph, all 40 million of them, to Glasgow. Right? We can do that once and for all. It takes a little while. It's an application of Dijkstra's algorithm. No big deal. You're only going to do it once. Then we store that value in every node. Now, that means that every node, let's say there are 40 million nodes. I've now got 40 million 32-bit you know, numbers. Oh, that's not so bad. Oh, we store that on a, you know, a little USB stick this size. It's not a big deal. Right? So every node is now going to know its exact distance by the shortest possible path, taking account of twisty mountain roads and so forth, to Glasgow. Now, we can get a good estimate for the distance to Troon. Look, can, I, can anybody see how, about how I might compute an estimate from the distance to Troon here? Well, look, if I want to get an estimate from the distance from Brighton to Troon, well, I could say I know the exact distance to Brighton, to Glasgow, that's 653 miles, and I know the exact distance from Troon to Glasgow, that's 16 miles. So that tells me the, uh, that I could not possibly get to Troon faster than... Um, <clears throat> Uh, right. So, um, uh, you know, if Troon was on the way to Glasgow, if it was sitting here on this shortest path, then I could get there in 653 minus 16, but I really couldn't get there any faster, right? Because if I could get to Troon faster than this number, 653 minus 16, then I could get to Glasgow by going Brighton, Troon, Glasgow, and that would be less than the 653. Are you with me? Are you convinced? I want you to be convinced on this point, right? That, the, that, that this 653 minus 16, which is a piece of arithmetic I can't do in my head on the stage, is the shortest possible distance that you could take you to Troon. It might take you longer to get to Troon, but you couldn't take you less than this. All right, all right. I'll let you off then. All right, so here's our landmark game. So now we've got pretty good lower bounds because these lower bounds have taken account of all the twisty mountain roads. Um, so we're going to pick a few landmarks, and we're going to store the exact shortest paths, and uh, we're, going to, we're going to take this subtraction thing. Um, and you can see that it works best if the landmark is on the other side of your destination. So remember here, this worked best if, if, Glasgow, ah, track, if Glasgow was the other side of Troon. If it was between you and Troon, it doesn't work so well. If it's beyond Troon, it works really well. If it's nowhere near Troon, it doesn't work well at all. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? What happens if it's not near Troon at all? Uh, you know, if, if I'm trying to go from uh, London to uh, Brighton, then a landmark of Glasgow is not much help. So what should I do? Someone else? Yes, yes. You put what? The nearest landmark. So we have more than one landmark, right? Yes. So we have more than one landmark, and then, we, and then what you're saying is you have to pick the nearest landmark to your destination and use that. Good. Uh, that, so that's more or less what we're going to do. In fact, it's, pretty, it's, it's even easier. You can just have a whole bunch of landmarks, and then you can, your lower bound is the least of the lower bound using landmark one, and the lower bound using landmark two, and the lower bound using landmark, landmark three, because I can choose each of the landmarks independently gives me a lower bound, so the minimum of all those is also a lower bound. So it's kind of what you said, but even simpler. So there you are. Um, <clears throat> or is it the, the maximum? Mm, I forget, something. I put max here. Oh, how embarrassing. You can work it out. 
your bright traps. So this is what happens. So here's Dijkstra, remember, ink blotting. And with this algorithm, with landmarks, oh, the little dots around the edge here are the landmarks. Right, so they chose a dozen landmarks, and they put them around the edge so that at least one landmark was likely to be p beyond your destination. And look at how cool it is now. Look at just the green and the blue stuff. You can still do the bidirectional thing. And you can see that there's a lot, lot less work being done. Isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing. Sort of look amazed. Oh, that, that's good. That was good. Yeah. Great. Uh, let's see. So here's, here it is in numbers. Look, it takes, uh, took four minutes of um, pre-processing time. Bidirectional Dijkstra didn't take any pre-processing time. This thing took a bit of pre-processing time. And these megabytes, this is the amount of data required to store the map. Before, 28 megabytes. After, 132 megabytes. 132 megabytes? No big deal these days. Okay, but how long does it take to do the query? Instead of 340 seconds, 12 seconds. That still seems like quite a long time, but it's a lot less than it was before. Okay, 30 times faster, four times less memory, good deal. Especially as memory's cheap. All right? It's a kind of cunning al algorithm. So uh, I'm not going to have to, uh, there are sort of three other good ideas that Andrew Goldberg and his colleague has had that I'm not going to tell you about. But I'm going to encourage you to go and read their paper. I read their paper. It's not even that hard. Um, so uh, uh, we got as far as here, and the part above is the part I'm not going to tell you about because I, I knew it wasn't, but I just wanted to flick it past you because I wanted to show you the picture here. So here's the picture with the, um, uh, the landmark idea. And here is a further refinement on the landmark idea. It involves an idea called reach, which you can read about in their papers. And that, as you can see, does even less. There's even fewer green and blue nodes here. And it goes even faster. So now we're down to 0.73 seconds, down from 340 seconds. And the amount of data, 200 megabytes rather than 28. This is a big difference. Now you start to be able to do it on your phone. So, um, uh, oh, uh, just to remark here, this is 1.6 million vertices. Here's the whole of Europe, which is, uh, what, 18 million vertices. So this is all the intersections in Europe. So there aren't that many intersections in Europe. Big place Europe, but not so many street junctions. Um, and it's still, it's still pretty quick. Um, OK, so uh, uh, what, what, what's the message? The message is an ounce of cunning beats a ton of brute force. I think it's really beautiful that with a bit of cunning and pre-processing and just a bit of data gathered in advance, you can make these huge increases in speed. Um, and if you look at what we did is, we, uh, we boiled away the complexity of the algorithm into a, a small problem that we could sort of tackle without thinking about geography and roads and stuff and wiggly things. We just had this graph with vertices, and then we carefully added some extra information, this lower bound information, which again was a kind of abstract thing. So this happens again and again in computing, right, that you were... Uh, you take, a, uh, you take a complex real-world problem, you boil out some abstract, um, simple, kind of almost mathematical stuff. From that, you make an algorithm that you can apply back to the real world. But without doing that abstraction, you wouldn't have a chance of dealing with the complexity of it. So, a lot more than just programming.